What's up, folks? Here I am. I'm set up at my house. I'm giving you a lecture. All right, here we go. Okay, so um, I'm going to be uh, trying to follow along with our slides and our learning goals as I would um, in the class. Okay, um, and so you can see here's how I'm going to be interfacing this. I've got um, the slides. I've got a whiteboard here where I can take notes. Um, so I'm not going to be annotating on the slides like I normally do, um, but I do want to encourage you to uh, print them if you're able or use them on your uh, digital device to, to fill out just like we would in class. Um, and for this uh, thermodynamics chapter, this chapter 17, um, I'm going to split this up into three uh, video lectures and then um, there will be a quiz that you can take at the end that will be just like uh, our clicker quiz. And um, I'll give you um, some more details on that soon, but um, effectively you're going to take it on Canvas. Uh, it'll be 10 minutes, five questions, multiple choice, just, just like we would normally. Um, so just make sure you watch all three of these videos, you take notes, um, ask questions, you know, before proceeding on to the quiz. Um, and uh, you can also take the homework assignment as we're going. Um, okay, so I'm going to get into it right away. So uh, you've talked about uh, thermodynamics in uh, Chem 109, and you dealt largely with the first law of thermodynamics. Um, and so now what we're really getting into in this chapter is the second and third law of thermodynamics, which, spontane uh, which deals primarily with uh, spontaneous processes. So I've got this really nice uh, picture right here. You can see there's this lovely... Cadillac here, it's pristine, uh, you know, it, it's like fresh, right? And then I've got the same Cadillac here maybe 50 years later, and you can see it's a big rust bucket. And I think we all have some experience with this here. Um, if you leave a car just sitting out uh, and you don't do anything, spontaneously it's going uh, to oxidize. So this forward reaction is an oxidation reaction. And we know that this will happen um, without any outside intervention. So uh, spontaneous process, a process occurring without outside intervention, okay? Um, and so in this particular reaction, um, my spontaneous reaction going forward would be um, oxidation. And then of course the non-spontaneous reaction here would be a reduction uh, reaction. And so if we wanted this Cadillac to go uh, back to its pristine condition, um, we would have to like, you know, buff it, paint it, do a lot of work on it. So that gives us to this non-spontaneous process, um, a process that only occurs as long as energy is continually adding. So this process of like buffing out all that rust and painting it and so on, um, that would be like adding mechanical energy to get this car back to its pristine condition. Um, so in general, um, we can kind of start to think of this um, with a nice deep connection to equilibrium, which we've um, spent a lot of time this semester talking about. Okay, so if we imagine some reactant A and some product B, and uh, I'll use this same example that I have with the car, where I've got a spontaneous reaction going in the forward direction and a non spontaneous reaction going um, in the reverse reaction in the reverse direction okay and this is always true um, for equilibrium if we want to think of it in terms of having a um, more stable product and a less stable reactant um, and so we're going to connect this with some other thermodynamic um, parameters some that we haven't seen before um, but in any event, we're going to start kind of slow with this and just think about this logically, right? If we have a less stable reactant, it's going to spontaneously form a more stable product, but going in the reverse direction will require some amount of work. And so also, um, what's, what's common, not always true, but what's common is usually the forward reaction will be exothermic and the reverse reaction will be endothermic. And that's in this case where we have something more stable and less stable. Now, interestingly, there are a few examples where the reverse is true, 
where the spontaneous reaction is actually endothermic and the reverse reaction is exothermic. So this is definitely the most common, we'll say, but doesn't have to be um, always true. Okay. And so here's an example of that. Um, so these are cold packs. Any of you that have, uh, are prone to spraining your ankles or injuring yourself, you're probably familiar with these cold packs. And what they have in them is ammonium nitrate as a solid, so crystalline ammonium nitrate, right? Looks something like this. And there's a thin membrane that separates um, a pouch of water from this uh, salt. And when you kind of break it and mix it up, right, you puncture that membrane, and then um, it makes a solution. And as it turns out, the enthalpy of solution formation for ammonium nitrate. So to make an ammonium nitrate solution, in other words, going from, uh, let's see, NH4, NO3 solid over to NH4, NO3 aqueous, right? This actually requires an input of energy. Okay, and then so to go back um, the other way would actually release energy. So in this case, this forward step is endothermic and this reverse step is exothermic. So how is it able to happen spontaneously? Well, um, as it turns out, because the solution, uh, to form the solution, it, it needs heat, it actually takes heat from the water, thus lowering the water's temperature, right? It takes the water's kinetic energy and converts it to potential energy, so it drops the temperature of the water. And that happens spontaneously, uh, which is pretty cool. Okay, so, um, as I said, it doesn't always have to be the case that a forward spontaneous reaction is exothermic. That's the most common case, and if you think about like a fire or an explosion or something like that, right, spontaneous combustion, that's an exothermic reaction going um, in the forward direction. Um, but as I demonstrated with these cold packs, you can actually have um, an endothermic, a spontaneous endothermic reaction going in the forward direction. Okay, so moving on, we'll get into now the driving force of thermodynamic spontaneity, um, and that's entropy. And you've probably heard the term uh, entropy before, and this is kind of like the most common um, picture for entropy. We see this like messy dorm room or something like that, and we could even go on to say that um, this room becomes messy spontaneously, right, just by living naturally and throwing your underwear and stuff everywhere, right, it gets messy on its own. And then to clean it up, right, to to go the reverse reaction, you would have to supply uh, work to put all the stuff away. Um, and so that's an okay picture of entropy, and that kind of will get you, you know, a little bit into the door. But um, there, there's some better ways to think of this, and, and I'm going to get into that next. But, um, you know, to, to finish summarizing the slide here, um, this room, right, has lots of disorder. So generally thought of a measure of disorder, um, but that's not totally correct, and I'll, and I'll show you why in a second, okay? Um, so, uh, okay, so I just wanted to talk about um, disorder and entropy in um, not just a messy dorm room, but right, like in, in a chemical system, a common chemical system, and that is going through the phase transitions of water. So if I start here on the right, um, you know, hopefully this is something nice and familiar to you all, um, right? If we start with the solid and uh, we supply energy, we know that it's spontaneously going to become a liquid. And really, you know, we don't have to continually supply an energy, right? If we just take an ice cube and put it on a, on a bench, take the ice cube out of the freezer and put it on the lab bench, right, and step back, we know it's going to spontaneously melt. It's going to spontaneously acquire heat from the room. And of course, if we put some liquid water in an even uh, hotter room, it's going to spontaneously acquire heat to become a gas. And so, of course, going through the reverse of that, right, if we go from a gas back to a liquid, we know that um, it's going to give energy back out. 
And then similarly, to go from the liquid to the solid, it's also going to give energy back out. Um, so that's kind of review. What's, what's probably new now is if you want to think about this in terms of um, entropy and uh, which has more or which has less, we start thinking about this in terms of uh, the molecular modes of motion, which are translation, vibration, and rotation. So if you think about this solid here, everything is locked in to its crystal lattice, right? We talked about this at the beginning of the semester. And so the molecules can kind of vibrate against each other, but they're not going to really like translate all the way around, nor can they rotate all the way around. They're pretty locked in there. Um, and as it turns out, they're very orderly as a result. There's a lot of order in this solid. So in the liquid, things are a little bit more spread out, okay? And so the molecules are able to vibrate, um, but they're actually also able to translate. They're actually able to move around a lot more, but they still can't rotate um, because of the hydrogen bonding network. So there's um, more, uh, so it's still very ordered in a liquid, but it's less ordered than the solid. So the liquid is more disordered than is the solid. And then finally, when we get to the gas, not only is the gas free to vibrate and translate, but it's actually free um, to rotate. The molecules, right, are very far apart from each other. So a gas has a lot of disorder. So in general, solids um, do not have a lot of entropy. They have very low entropy. Liquids are, you know, in the middle, and uh, gases have a lot of entropy. Okay. So now I'm skipping ahead to um, section 7.10 here. This is like the end of the section, but I actually think this is a, a really natural time to introduce this idea of microstates because I think this is by far the best definition of entropy. The disorder order argument is a good one, um, but we can make this a little bit more quantifiable by introducing the concept of microstates. Okay, so the definition, the number of arrangements available to a system existing in a given state. An arrangement can be um, positions, energy levels. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time getting into this. Um, when you take uh, PCHEM with me later on in your academic career, we'll spend a whole semester talking about this stuff. Um, but for now, just kind of think of it as this simple like number of arrangements, number of ways. Um, that you can arrange something uh, in a given state. So that means all of these arrangements have to be um, equivalent in energy, okay? So this is the famous um, Boltzmann's equation right here. And here we have Ludwig Boltzmann himself. And here actually on his tombstone is the equation, okay? So he's got it written as S equals K log W. And here we're using it as... Um, S equals R ln W, and I'll show you the connection with that. Um, and so, of course, we can use, um, we're, we're using the base E uh, form of Boltzmann's equation. On his tombstone, he's got that base 10 form, okay? So here's uh, what I want to point out, okay? So W, this is number of microstates. microstates. It's a number, okay? So R is the gas constant. And we know that, so this flavor of R, um, the one we're going to use is 8.314 joule per mole K. And so what that means, the units of entropy, if you think about it, I'll, I'll give you 10 seconds to think about what the units of entropy have to be. Got to be joules per mole K, okay, right? Because... This chunk is going to be unitless. So there's also uh, another constant here that I'm going to introduce, and that's K sub B. Some um, places only call it K, like you can see on Boltzmann's tombstone there. Um, I, I commonly like to see it as K sub B. That's a subscript B. And that's Boltzmann's constant. Okay. K Boltzmann or Boltzmann's constant. And Boltzmann's constant is 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per
per molecule per Kelvin. And so if we compare these units for a second, joule per mole K and joule per molecule per K, Boltzmann's constant is in fact the gas constant, or I should really say the gas constant is Boltzmann's constant. They are related to each other by Avogadro's number. So if I take NA, Avogadro's number, uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 23, right? And I multiply it by K Boltzmann. I'll do this to prove it to you. This is cool. Let's see. Can you see my calculator? Awesome. Okay. So if I say uh, 6.022 E23 times 1.38 E to the negative 23. Ha ha. So I needed some more significant digits in there, right? But we get 8.314, um, et cetera. So in other words, Boltzmann's constant times Avogadro's number is the gas constant, which is kind of cool. And if we really start thinking about big picture, like what do these constants mean? What do they tell us? It's their entropy. They're the microstated weighted entropy constant, which is really, really cool. Okay, I'll give you an example. Suppose we have one single microstate. Okay, S equals. And then now we can use this equation as S equals R um, ln W, or we can use it as S equals K Boltzmann ln W. It's the same thing. And so then the only difference would be if we use the gas constant, then we're going to get um, the entropy in terms of the number of moles of something. But if we use Boltzmann's constant, we're going to get the entropy in terms of uh, number of molecules. So it's just basically a ratio of Avogadro's number. Okay. So for example, let's suppose we have W equals one, right? So, and I'll just use R to make that easy. We'll say R natural log of one. And hopefully by now you've remembered natural log of one equals zero. So this is a really important result that we'll see later on. When you only have one microstate, you have no entropy. And so I think this is the best um, possible definition of entropy is thinking of it really as uh, the number of microstates. Okay, and so as we increase the number of microstates, um, this entropy term is going to go up exponentially. Right? And so similarly, we could also calculate the number of microstates by rearranging this equation. And so I could rearrange this equation by saying uh, up here, so um, divide R by both sides and then take E of both sides, and we would get W equals E of S divided by R. And so this is another really cool definition of uh, microstate. You can see a microstate is an exponentially weighted term of entropy and uh, the gas constant or Boltzmann's constant. Okay, so let's keep moving on and let's do some more examples of these microstates. Okay, so and this is an example from the book, but I really like this uh, example. And so um, what we have here uh, we have a two bulb flask. So imagine this is like some crazy piece of glassware that's got like two chambers. And uh, suppose that we could pump just only four molecules into this thing. It's not a, a realistic example, but let's just pretend we can do it anyways. So we could have um, four molecules on the left and no molecules on the right. We could have three on the left and one on the right, or we could have two and two. Um, or back to one and three, or back to zero and four, okay? So these, what we would call here, these arrangements would be our macro states, okay? Because now, if we accept that we can put a label on each one of these molecules, and if you kind of zoom in here, um, you'll be able to see that this is now labeled A, B, C, D, okay? then now this becomes a unique microstate. And so now if we look at this macrostate of the 3-1 arrangement, and again, considering that we have labels um, A, B, C, and D, we can uniquely identify each one of these molecules, okay? I could have arrangements with B, D, C, and A. 
or A, C, uh, D on the left, and then B on the right, and so forth. So I'd actually get four resulting microstates just from this one um, macrostate. And if you keep counting up here, the arrangement where we have two and two would result in actually six microstates if you do all those pairwise combinations. And then of course the reverse would be true for these other states. Um, so now when you add all of these up, we actually get 11 microstates. One plus four is five, uh, plus six is 11, right? So that, or excuse me, plus another five is 16. 16 microstates from this arrangement. So now of course, imagine now trying to do this with like a mole of molecules and it will be impossible to actually count all this stuff. So I'm gonna go back up for a second here. That's why typically it's impossible to know the number of microstates. It's, there's just too many to count and I'm gonna prove that to you in a second. So that's why I think entropy, you know, we can talk about in terms of disorder and order, but a really uh, a good way to think of this and a good way to measure it is um, by really thinking of it in terms of microstates. And then once again, we can't really count the number of microstates, but as I'll show it to you later, we can measure entropy in some creative ways. Um, so that in principle then, uh, we could then calculate the number of microstates once we know um, what the entropy is. Okay, so I'm gonna give another example here on this microstates and this quantized view of entropy. And here's an example that you can um, think about for a second. And um, I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time doing this calculation. This is kind of a throwback maybe to your stats class. Um, and so if I had this now, back to the two ball flask, right? What's the probability of finding all the molecules in the left flask if there's only one molecule, two, 10, or one mole, okay? So if we just work through this really quick, if there's, um, if there's only like, you know, one molecule on this side and none on that side, then it's pretty, pretty obvious there's going to be a 50% chance of finding that one molecule on the left. So that 50%, that's one over two. Okay, so now what if there's two molecules? What's the likelihood of finding two molecules in the flask? Well, I think if you work out all those pairwise combinations, you'll work out that that's a 25% chance, okay? Which is one over two to the power two, okay? And so now if we say, well, what if there's 10? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So this is pretty, becomes pretty difficult to count but if we were to follow with our um, stats here, right, it's gonna be one over two to the power 10. And uh, let's do that math really quick. Two power 10, one over. Uh, that is a nine point eight percent chance. Okay, so you can see it's diminishing way down as we go. Oh, that's not correct. Uh, excuse me. It was 0.0098%. Yes. Okay, in any event, now if we want to think of it in terms of the mole, right, it's going to be 1 over 2 to the Avogadro's number. That's going to be a crazy small chance of finding one mole of molecules completely over on the left and not over on the right. Um, and this is why I think the, um, the Arthur C. Clarke book, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or no, uh, excuse me, Douglas Clark, um, it's really funny, right, where they talk about the improbability drive. That's really kind of what we're dealing with here. Not situations that are necessarily impossible, just really, really improbable. So this would be a very, very improbable chance of finding this. And of course, the number of microstates that result in it would be humongous. Okay, so here's a good review question. I'll, I'll pause here for a second, see if you've been paying attention. You can think about this answer. And uh, yep, yeah, read the question and I'll answer it here in just a moment. 
Okay, a moment's up. Hopefully you pause the video. So, uh, which phase has the largest entropy and why? Which phase has the smallest entropy and why? Okay, so if we have right our solid, liquid, and our gas. So the solid has, if you recall, the smallest entropy and the gas has the largest entropy, the largest S, and as far as Y, well, it's the number of microstates, okay? So the gas has a really large number of microstates. It's free to move around all over the place, um, whereas the solid is what we would call entropically constrained. So it can only exist in a very, very small number of microstates, okay? So, we're getting near to the end of uh, what I think will be this lecture. Let's keep going forward, and I'm now going to introduce the concept of, finally, the second law of thermodynamics, okay? And so this is really um, uh, how we're going to view if something is spontaneous or not. Okay, so the second law of thermodynamics says, the change in total entropy must increase in the due course of a spontaneous process. Beautiful. And so now this is very Beautiful. different than what we did with um, the first law of thermodynamics. We didn't really necessarily separate system from surrounding. Um, I mean, you did when you talked about exothermic and endothermic, but as far as uh, the second law is concerned, there's a really intimate connection with the system and the surroundings, okay? And so I'm going to write this. Um, so we often see this also written as S universe equals delta S system plus delta S surroundings. Okay. So I often like to say delta S total instead of delta S universe. Uh, because I think when we say delta S universe, you have this idea that you're talking about planets and stars and galaxies and stuff. Which you can if you want, but uh, this is a chemistry class. So um, I often like to just think of this as S total, which is our system and our surroundings. And this is probably by far um, one of the most tricky uh, things in your undergraduate um, education of thermodynamics is deciding what is the system and what is the surroundings. And you're kind of free to choose, but um, you can make the wrong choice. So you have to choose wisely what's the system and what's the surroundings. Okay. So, for a process to be spontaneous, delta S total must be greater than zero. So, in other words, what that means is we could have scenarios in which the entropy, so, and remember, this is the change in entropy. I'm going to talk about this delta thing in a minute. Um, we could have scenarios in which the system's entropy actually decreases where this is negative, but we still have a spontaneous process. Because as long as the total is greater than zero, as long as the sum of both the system and the surroundings is greater than zero, a process will be spontaneous, okay? And I'm gonna summarize that here uh, in a second, okay? So let's, I'm gonna move on here and just a, a reminder of what this delta is and what state functions are um, so if you recall, with the state function, right, with this delta, I'll just say um, delta x, any state function. And remember, in a state function, we know a state function because it has a capital letter, right? So when we use the um, delta h or delta e or uh, pick any of your, your favorite state functions, right, with a capital letter that's how we know it's a state function right and that's always x final minus x initial and it doesn't matter um, the path right what happens between the final and the initial state does not matter for a state function so convince yourself you remember what a positive state function means or what a positive delta s means and what a negative delta s means i'll just pause for one second while you think through that Okay, so a positive 
delta s means that s final had to be greater than s initial, right? So that if entropy is increasing, um, we could say the final state is more chaotic. If we wanted to use that disorder definition, more chaotic um, or less chaotic, right, for the initial. So in other words, as the process occurred, um, it had an increase in its number of microstates, or it became more disorderly, if you like that better. And so a negative delta S means that the final entropy had to be less than the initial entropy. So in other words, the system became more organized. It became more orderly. That's what a decrease in entropy means. Okay, so uh, let's see here. So if I go back to the second law really quick for a moment, and remembering that for a process to be spontaneous, delta S total must be greater than zero. And this is only for spontaneity, right? For spontaneous process. Not all processes have to be spontaneous and not all processes are spontaneous. But if one is to be spontaneous, its total entropy is greater than zero. And so that means the sum of the entropy of the system, change in entropy of the system, and the change in entropy of the surroundings, when you add them together, it must be a positive number. We can have situations in which one is negative and the other is positive, and as long as the positive one is greater than the negative one, it will be spontaneous. But if it's the reverse, if um, we add them together and then the total entropy is negative, it's a non-spontaneous process. Okay, moving on. So let's talk about temperature and entropy. Okay, so... When we think about an exothermic process, let's just remind ourselves, we remember what exothermic is, right? We're specifically exothermic is for delta H, and now I'm going to specify, and I'm going to say that delta H of the system is less than zero, okay? So then now, if we specifically are thinking about the connection to the surroundings, and the entropy of the surroundings, okay? If the system is exothermic, it's evolving heat out to the surroundings, right? So if it's pumping heat back out to the surroundings, it's gonna make the molecules move faster. They're going to be a little bit more chaotic. And thus the delta S in the surroundings will be positive. It will be greater than zero, okay? But now what about our endothermic process? So we know the entropy, or excuse me, the enthalpy of the system has to be greater than zero during an endothermic process, okay? And so that means it has to be acquiring heat from the surroundings. And so if it's acquiring heat from the surroundings, then it's going to leave the surroundings in a more organized state. It's going to take kinetic energy from the surroundings and that's going to decrease the number of microstates in the surroundings, all right? So we can see there's a deep connection here between the entropy of the surroundings specifically and the enthalpy of the system. And so you can see that they're actually the opposite. So when delta H system is negative, delta S surroundings is positive. When delta H system is positive, delta H surroundings is negative. So make sure you keep that uh, straight, okay? Okay, so moving forward, we're nearing the end of what I wanna do today for this lecture. Okay, so now here is an example where we have the delta S of our system is 22.0 joules per Kelvin. And often you'll see this um, per mole or per molecule unit uh, dropped, okay? 
Um, yes. Okay. So uh, we'll have now uh, 22.0 joule per Kelvin. So if this was like, you know, joules just per one molecule per Kelvin, okay? And so that is my system, delta S system. And then we know it's going to be plus delta S surroundings. And so now our surroundings was negative 20.4 negative 20.4 joule per Kelvin. And this means the delta S universe or delta S total, as I prefer to call it, is positive 1.6 joules per Kelvin. Uh, so yes, this spontaneous, or this process is spontaneous. Even though you can see the surroundings had um, almost the same amount of decrease as the entropy of the system's increase. All the same, when they combined, the total entropy was positive. So this process will occur spontaneously. Okay? And so let's summarize all of the possibilities here with the second law. And I'm just going to leave um, this equation written up here. So if both the system and the surrounding are positive, right? If the entropy of the system increases and the entropy of the surroundings increase, it's always spontaneous. If the entropy of the system decreases and the entropy of the surroundings increases, it's only spontaneous if the increase of entropy in the surroundings outweighs the decrease in entropy of the system, right? So make sure that you, that you understand that, right? If the, so if the surroundings is positive, right, the absolute value of that number has to be greater than the absolute value of the systems. And if, if the opposite is true, it's non-spontaneous. And so then, of course, this whole scenario uh, flips around if now the entropy of the system um, increases and the entropy of the surroundings decreases. Okay? And as we'll see, um, in these scenarios in which the system and the surroundings are opposite, Temperature plays a really important role, and we're going to explore that um, soon, okay? And so now if both are negative, if both the entropy of the system and both the entropy of the surroundings are negative, then it's always a non-spontaneous process, okay? And so now um, I think the last thing that I'll talk about before ending this lecture, uh, calculations involving entropy, and I think this is kind of a nice summary of what we've said before. So the units of entropy, right? Joule per mole per Kelvin. Um, so those last examples that you saw were just joule per Kelvin. And so this would be in the case of using uh, K Boltzmann um, for the um, S equals K Boltzmann natural log of W, okay? And then now, um, in the case of using joule per mole K, this is where we would use R. S equals R natural log of W. And so because of that per Kelvin, so if you notice here, um, what I'm showing you right here is, really we know joules is a measure of energy or even heat, right? And Kelvin is a measure of temperature. So more generally, these units... Uh, An entropy is heat flow per temperature. And so as I mentioned, um, there is an important connection to temperature with entropy. And I'm just going to very briefly introduce that now. And uh, we'll explore that in more detail in the coming lectures. And so we also talked about the um, connection of delta S surroundings with the connection of delta H, delta H of the system. Right, I showed you that when you have an exothermic process, so when delta H is negative, delta S is positive, but if delta S were negative, then delta H has to be positive. And because we know there's the temperature there, uh, this gets us to another equation with respect to entropy. Delta S surroundings equals the negative delta H system divided by temperature, or more generally, delta S equals delta H divided by T. And the sign right there manifests when comparing 
surroundings or systems. So this is our general equation, delta S equals delta H divided by T. But if we were to put labels on that and specifically say surroundings and system, keep in mind, you got to have a negative sign. If it's surroundings and surroundings, it's the same sign. If it's system and system, it's the same sign. But if it's system and surroundings, it's an opposite sign. Uh, okay. And so then, of course, we can also expand on this. And this will be the last thing I expand on. Delta S total equals then, of course, delta H system divided by temperature of the system minus delta H of the system over the temperature of the surroundings. So we noted that delta S total, right, should be uh, delta S system plus delta S surroundings. Right, but because of this opposite relationship here, that's where that negative sign appears. So now if we have knowledge of the temperature of the system and the surroundings and the delta H of just here the system, that's what makes this nice, the way we're using this equation. We don't have to know what the delta H of the surroundings are. We have another good way of calculating delta S total. And we'll do a few of these examples um, here, I think, in the coming slides. Okay, let's see, let me just make sure that I haven't missed anything. Okay, great, yeah, we'll do a couple more examples later. Um, okay, and so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go to uh, switch over to our um, learning goals here, okay? And so just to give you an idea of what we've discussed, um, so we did this number one, understand the concept of entropy and how the change in entropy corresponds to the spontaneous or non-spontaneous process. Okay. Um, we talked about the concept of microstates and how it relates to entropy and be able to perform simple calculations. Um, we'll do a couple of these calculations in my next uh, video here. And then know the second law of thermodynamics and perform calculations. So we've probably only done about half of this learning goal. So we've done maybe, um, you know, like let's say uh, about 70% of these three learning goals. Um, okay, folks, so I'll conclude um, this particular video. Um, I'm going to record the next one here in about five minutes. So you're going to see me wearing the same shirt. Um, so uh, make sure that you follow through this that you were taking notes actively just like you would do in class. And I'll see you on the next video.